story eleven of the crimson gardenia and other tales of adventure by rex beach this librivox recording is in the public domain story eleven the brand part two news of the john daniel strike reached ophir in july when a ragged unkempt man arrived in a poling boat he was one of the party that had camped west of mcgill and he ate a raw potato with the ravenous appetite of an animal while waiting for his first meal at the miner's rest between mouthfuls he gave the word that set the town ablaze when he had bought a ton of grub at the a c store and weighed out payment in bright pumpkin seed gold he went to hopper's saloon and handed the proprietor a folded paper hopper read it uncomprehendingly this is a location notice recorded in my name the latter said turning the document uncomprehendingly as if to see if it contained a message on the reverse side the stranger nodded number four above on john daniels creek john staked for you and told me to tell you to come we've struck it rich hopper's hand shook he stared at the speaker in bewilderment john daniels i don't seem to remember him he's a big slab-sided man with a deep voice and eyes like ice the listener started is he skookum stronger than any two men god it's mcgill i thought so but i never saw him only once that was in circle he's changed now got a beard he said you done him a favor once you're his friend ain't you i am what's the trouble with him there was a pause you can tell me he put me and my five partners in on his strike i'm taking grub to him and the others oh it was about a woman of course it always is everybody here knows the story she was no good except to look at feller named barclay brought her into the country but dan didn't know it so he up and marries her she thought he had money and when she found he was broke like the rest of us she and barclay began cutting up again it was rotten i came near putting barclay away but figured dan wouldn't like anybody to do his work so i told him he went out to clean the slate but found his wife was crazy about the skunk and always had been so he sent him away together he done it for her sake but he warned him to stay off his trail because no camp was big enough to hold all three of em it was blizzardy and what did the blame fools do but get caught ten miles below here cochran brought him back that night on his sled mcgill was here right where you're standin when they were lugged in when he seen barclay he went after him again figurin i suppose that god was disgusted with his proposition and had sent the feller back to be finished good said the stranger and he got him huh no barclay wasn't more'n half dead and the woman fell to begging for his life again she appealed to all of us mcgill must have loved her more'n we give him credit for because when he saw that neither one of them was able to leave he left instead he walked right out of that door into the wickedest storm we had that season and we never seen him again everybody thought he froze or the wolves got him that was a year ago last winter what become of the woman oh her and barclay left for dawson on the first boat i guess they saw we didn't enjoy him here and barclay didn't nobody offer to bump him off the ragged stranger was incredulous no we just left him and the woman alone most of us was kind of sorry for her sorry why well hopper hesitated i don't think she exactly understood what she was doing you know the first winter up here is hard on tender feet especially women most of em act mighty queer before they calm down she'd have come to herself if mcgill had given her time Hmm, it's too late now both men nodded when'll you leave for john daniels creek when now i've got enough of this camp and i'll have these bar fixtures packed in two hours mcgill or john daniels as he chose to call himself saw his dream come true the first stampeders came in august gaunt fellows worn by sleepless days and nights during which they had fought the swift waters and the fear of pursuit they were followed by a tiny river boat then an a c packet loaded heavy and carrying hopper with his bar fixtures and fifteen barrels of whiskey she had been aground a hundred times and had passed other stranded craft laden with men who cursed her as she gained the lead a city of tents sprang up on the flats 
it changed to one of cabins when the first snows flew john daniels creek was overrun at nights its tortuous course was lit by glowing fires smoke hung above it constantly it became pitted with prospect holes trails were broken to adjoining creeks where similar scenes were enacted but of all who came few saw and almost none spoke to john daniels himself for he never went to town and there was no welcome at his cabin of course his name was on every tongue but he toiled underground by day and hid himself by night sometimes hopper on his way to or from number four above would stop over and spend an evening with him but not often meanwhile great ash-gray pay dumps grew upon discovery and there were rumors of a fabulous bedrock inlaid with gold but daniels did all his own sampling so there was no way of verifying the reports when the spring sluicing was finished it was said that he had cleaned up half a million daniels himself huge gaunt gray-bearded and silent saw his gold loaded aboard the first steamer and accompanied it to the outside this being his first trip to the states in ten years during his absence the new camp of arcadia grew for its fame had spread it changed from a formless cluster of log shacks to a small city of sawed lumber and paint one season had made the wilderness into a frontier town the next made of it a metropolis with the current that flowed thither from the distant camps came the scum of the north country following the first tide of venturesome strong-limbed men came the weaklings the maimed and crooked of body and soul the parasites and idlers among these there were women of the customary kind and a number of men who lived upon their earnings barclay was one of them arcadia was in the fullest riot of its growth when john daniels returned late in the autumn he had expected to find a change but he was unprepared for the startling transformation that greeted his eyes it stirred him deeply for the town was his he had made it his hands had given it life he wondered if this could be his desolate camping-place of two seasons before where was the melancholy forest the brooding silence as he walked up the front street past the painted stores the vigorous life and optimism of the place electrified him he heard laughter and music the tinkle of pianos from the dance halls the sounds of revelry the air was filled with clamour it was pungent with smoke and with the manifold odours of a city everywhere was activity and haste of course the news of his return spread swiftly for he was a personage but before the curious could mark him he had left for the creek that bore his name where a hundred men were preparing to drift out discovery pay streak under his supervision he remained there a month during which the first gray snows turned white and brought that peculiar loneliness that depression of spirit which marks the beginning of winter then one day he decided to go to town the impulse surprised him for he had meant to shun the place as always but his summer in the world outside had worked a change and something within him hungered for companionship the glare of lights the sight of animated faces then too he was curious to examine this town of his at closer range it was worth seeing he decided proudly during his inspection it was a splendid healthy camp he walked the front street then prowled through the regions behind there were women in this part of arcadia and these he regarded distrustfully although he was more than once arrested by a glimpse of some cosy home and stood staring until warned by the frowns of indignant housewives that his presence was suspicious he remembered another cabin like these his own he had never quite grown accustomed to its white curtains and china dishes and similar delights any more than he had grown accustomed to the presence of that wonderful mysterious creature who had filled the place with light it was all part of another life a bewildering dream too agreeable to last in the course of his wanderings however he came into a different district one which offended him sorely immediately behind the saloons he found a considerable cluster of meaner shacks which were inhabited by women and yet which were not homes these gaudily curtained houses huddled close together as if for moral support 
or as if avoiding contact with their surroundings they crouched in the shelter of the gilded dance halls seeking a sort of protection in one another's disreputable company from some of the windows haggard faces smiled at daniels and he heard sounds of a merrymaking that were particularly offensive at this hour until this moment he had regarded arcadia with a fatherly pride and had not dreamed it was wicked hence this discovery enraged him he was not a sensitive man having trod the frontier where vice is naked but something about the rotten core of this new community sickened him it reminded him of a child diseased and then as if to point the comparison he saw a child a tiny fat round-faced person leading a puppy by a string now women were strange to john daniels since there had been but one in his life and he had possessed her only briefly but children were mysterious incomprehensible creatures phenomena which excited at once his awe and his amazement they made him ill at ease he had never touched one with the possible exception of an indian papoose now and then therefore his present meeting constituted an experience perhaps an adventure it was a white child too and it gazed at him with the disconcerting calmness of a full-grown person daniels was both embarrassed and shocked at its presence in this locality he hesitated then summoned his courage and said timidly say kid ain't you lost the child continued to stare at him in unaffected wonder leaving him painfully conscious of his absurd size and forbidding appearance he feared that once it had overcome its first amazement it would begin to cry and thus cover him with ignominy but happily for him the puppy experienced none of its owner's doubts and uncertainties it flattened its round stomach thumped its soft paws upon the sidewalk then approached the giant in a delirious series of wobbly leaps wiggling an eloquent if awkward declaration of friendship fine dog team you're driving sonny daniel smiled congratulating himself upon an admirable display of wit only to realize with a start that he had made a mistake some sixth sense informed him that this was not a boy it was a humiliating error say missy uh, you you don't belong here you're a plum off your trail that's a cinch he cast a worried glance over his shoulder and saw a hideous blanched face smile at him between a pair of red curtains he glared back at the woman and his cheeks grew hot meanwhile the little girl continued her unwinking examination she wore a ridiculous fur parka scarcely larger than daniel's cap and tiny mucklucks that made her legs look shorter and fatter than they were her mittens were the littlest things he had ever seen and he was regarding them wonderingly when she amazed him by approaching and laying one in his hand now this frank and full declaration of friendship reduced daniels to a helpless condition he had never been more troubled in his life he was vaguely frightened and yet he thrilled in an unaccountable manner at the touch he was half minded to withdraw his hand from his glove and retreat leaving it in her possession but thought again of these evil surroundings and of the responsibility that had devolved upon him with her surrender in the midst of his dumbness the young lady burst into a bubbling and intimate recital of her adventures which doubtless would have been perfectly intelligible to her mother but which left the discoverer of john daniel's creek floundering for a translation he concealed his disgraceful ignorance by an easy assumption of understanding he nodded he winked he grinned he eyed the infinitesimal hand that lay in his then gingerly removed his own glove the better to safeguard its treasure whereupon the small mitten promptly closed over one of his big knuckled fingers daniels gasped and held his digit as rigid as a pick handle escape was no longer possible having finished her recital the tot burst into a funny gurgle which plainly established a deep and undying intimacy between them then like all maidens who have pledged their affections she made plain her readiness to accompany her protector to the end of the world but the puppy held back and delayed progress as effectively as a ship's anchor so fearing to exert too great a strain upon his extended finger daniels gave the animal boldly into her embrace 
one short arm encircled the dog's neck whereupon as if by habit it limply resigned itself to misery the three went slowly out of that sin-ridden place the man dazed and delighted the child loquacious and trustful the puppy with lolling tongue and legs protruding stiffly daniels had mastered many dialects in his time from chinook to pigeon english but to save himself he could make nothing out of this language some words were plain but they were lost in a bubbling flow of strange moist lisping articulations that left the general meaning obscure she answered all his questions eagerly fully and he acknowledged she knows what she's sayin all right but i'm as rattled as a tenderfoot nevertheless he derived a preposterous delight from this experience until he realized that they were wandering aimlessly then thoughts of a possible encounter with a distracted parent filled him with such dismay that he appealed to the first woman he met lady if you know where this baby lives well, certainly i know then take her home her mother'll think i'm a kidnapper daniels perspired at the thought the woman laughingly accepted the responsibility of a full explanation but as she lifted the child it turned up its face to daniels quite as a matter of course the rosebud lips awaited him yet he did not understand he inquired blankly now what does she want a kiss don't you dearie god almighty breathed the man then he lowered his bearded face he was trembling when the strangers had gone he felt those moist baby lips against his and the sensation almost overcame him he didn't like the woman's appearance but she seemed tender-hearted and uh, there was no better way of ensuring the safety of his little charge than to give her over but that kiss it remained upon his lips more fragrant more holy than anything he had ever conceived it left him a conscious of his own uncleanness and shortcomings still in a daze he looked down at his index finger which remained rigid it was blue with the cold but he felt nothing except the clasp of a tiny woolen mitt well he exploded i don't seem to be dreaming she liked me she must have or she wouldn't have kissed me she sure did and i god i'd trade discovery for another one he felt no further interest in arcadia he thought only of the child and the amazing adventure that had come to him he could think of nothing else during the afternoon more than once he touched his lips timidly with his tongue and bared his hand to stare at his big finger when he had dined that evening he began a leisurely round of the saloons and gambling halls pausing at each one to invite every one to drink as befitted a man of wealth he played more or less without knowing whether he won or lost for his thoughts were directed in other and stranger channels the elite was the most pretentious place of amusement in arcadia and it was running full blast when he strolled in late that night the show was over in the theatre but a dance was going on beyond the people at the gambling tables he saw swiftly moving figures and heard the caller shouts through the rhythmic beat of the orchestra he looked on with some interest until he could engage the attention of a bartender then said call everybody up for a drink when the fellow eyed him distrustfully he explained i'm john daniels he was amused at the instant almost ludicrous change of expression and at the alacrity with which the crowd responded to his invitation they stampeded the games were deserted the sleepers roused themselves even the dancers came trooping forth with his name upon their lips the music ended discordantly and the musicians followed them the long bar was lined six deep by people who elbowed one another for a glimpse of the famous john daniels those who succeeded beheld a huge grim-featured man bearded to the cheekbones who seemed deaf to their remarks and heedless of their stares his hair was long and gray his eyes were small and bright and hard he looked like a mormon elder it took time to serve such an assemblage and during the delay daniel stood motionless vaguely resenting this curiosity when the bartender said all set he raised his glass and exclaimed drink hearty as the glass left his lips 
his eyes ran down the bar and along the bank of faces clear to the end where the dance-hall girls had squeezed themselves in there they rested and widened his hand fell heavily crushing the glass beneath it for facing him clinging to the rail as if about to fall stood his wife their eyes met fairly daniel saw in hers the first flaming light of recognition then that expression of deathly terror that he remembered he felt the floor sinking saw the nearby figures whirling heard the clamor die after his first start not a muscle of his face moved but his eyes began slowly to search through the crowd as if for some one and seeing that she understood with a hand to her throat she groped her way blindly out of the crush then made for the rear but her knees forsook her and she paused leaning against the wall it never occurred to her that she might escape she knew without looking when he came toward her he spoke in an emotionless tone saying come and she followed half swooning followed him up the stairs to the curtained boxes that ran round the gallery when they were alone she faced him managing to utter so you are john daniels they said you were dead she expected some violence death perhaps but he only looked at her silently with an expression she could not read she felt she must scream she swayed her eyes were filmed with terror well why don't you do it mcgill why don't you she cried hysterically where is barclay he inquired he's here somewhere we came three weeks ago we uh, i didn't know he saw that she was not the woman he had known she was frail broken her fluttering hands were thin and bloodless she had no spirit so he's got you working eh? Huh? you're one of these uh, rustlers well, i had to do something all i know is stage work this ain't stage work she nodded wearily he made me go the limit made you did you get a divorce no daniels cursed so harshly that she flinched although she had long since grown accustomed to profanity then he turned away but reading murder in his face she seized him with fingers that were like claws wait don't do that you love him don't you no no but he's bad now and probably drunk he'll kill you mcgill he's bad i tell you tough don't you understand he's bad and he's made me bad too that's why i'm here he's not worth it mcgill neither am i you can't stay in arcadia neither of you i got out of ophir and let you alone but this is my town i can't leave it we'll go she cried wringing her hands anyhow i'll go if you'll help me but i'll need help oh god yes i'll need help you don't know you and he can settle things afterward you want to leave him i've tried to break away i've been trying ever since that first day in ophir but he won't let me i kept trying until i learned better now i'm afraid he's broken me dan but you'll help me to leave him won't you after a time the husband answered more to himself than to her i guess i'm even with you anyhow you've gone to hell hand in hand with him i won't interfere not that way i suppose he beats you she nodded and saw his bearded face twitch yes and he'll make me like these other women you understand i fought until i'm tired worn out i'm in a trap mcgill and i'm afraid afraid for the little soul i have left you sprung the trap he told her bitterly but his wife had seen a way of freedom and clutched at it with desperate persistence listen i want to talk to you come with me for a minute come why never mind oh it's all right you owe me something for i still have your name do this for me please it's only a step he yielded to her imploring eyes and followed grudgingly down the back stairs and into the night wondering the while at his own weakness she led the way bareheaded heedless of the cold they were in that ill-favored district he had penetrated earlier in the day but if it had been offensive then it was doubly so now with its muffled sounds of debauchery and wickedness she paused finally fumbling at the door of one miserable structure whereupon he growled you live here you're worse than Shh! 
she said a finger on her lips as she led him in and lit a lamp then she beckoned him toward the single rear room shading the light with one hand and inviting him silently to peer over her shoulder the surprise of what he saw struck mcgill dumb for there in a crib lay the tiny lass who had befriended him that afternoon her lips were pouting sweetly her face was flushed with dreams one plump little arm was outside the covers and just below the doubled fist mcgill saw the deep dimpled bracelet of babyhood her presence made of these squalid surroundings a place of purity the room became suddenly a shrine the son of a gun said mcgill inanely then his face darkened once more i know her he announced grimly what are you doing with that kid in this hell-hole from the alleyways nearby came a burst of ribaldry but the woman's face was shining when she answered why she's mine my baby we have no other home he did not could not speak so she said simply now you see why i must leave barclay and all this your baby mcgill's eyes dropped to the index finger of his right hand then he touched his lips curiously barclay won't let me run straight i've always wanted to and now i must for the baby's sake when this brought no response she continued with growing intensity but in a lowered tone she'll begin to understand things before long she'll hear about him and me then what she'll think for herself and she'll never forget a thing like that never how can she grow up to be good if she learns the truth it wouldn't let her nobody could stay good around barclay even i couldn't and i was a woman when i met him i'm decent inside mcgill honestly i am and i've been sorry every day since you left oh i've paid for what i did and i'll pay more if i have to but she mustn't be part of the price no you've got to help me don't you see she mistook his gesture of bewilderment for one of refusal then hurried to one final frenzied appeal although at a fearful cost to herself it was this which had come to her in the dance hall it was this that she had led up to without allowing herself time in which to weaken listen she shouldn't stay with me even if i get away it wouldn't be good for her besides barclay would find us some time or if he didn't i'm too sick to last much longer then she'd be alone you're rich mcgill you're john daniels you'll have to take her not for my sake understand but i the man started i take barclay's baby great god there was a moment of silence during which the wife strove to steady herself and then she said she's not his she's yours ours mcgill uttered a great cry it issued from the depths of his being and racked him dreadfully he swung ponderously toward the rear room then fell to trembling so that he could not proceed he stared at the woman lifted his hands then dropped them his lips shook a fretful sleepy complaint issued from the chamber at which the mother raised a warning figure and the necessity for silence calmed him more quickly than anything else could have done my baby he whispered while he felt something melt within him and was filled with such an aching joy that he sobbed with the agony of it his wife's punishment overflowed when he breathed fiercely then give her to me you can't keep her you can't touch her you ain't fit she bowed her head in assent although his torture was nothing as compared with hers you'll help me get away from barclay won't you she asked supporting herself unsteadily barclay i forgot him he's the one that did all this ain't he he brought you to this and my baby too he made her live among women like this he raised her in slime the speaker's face became slowly frightfully distorted his wife went swiftly to him she struggled to fend him away from the door but he moved irresistibly they wrestled breathlessly so as not to waken the child while she begged him in the baby's name not to go not to bring blood upon her but he plucked her arms from around him and went out closing the door softly when he had gone mrs mcgill stood motionless her eyes closed her palms pressed over her ears as if to shut out a sound she dreaded 
barclay was dealing bank at one of the saloons when mcgill entered and came toward him down the full length of the room they recognized each other as their eyes met and the former sat back stiffly in his chair feeling that the dead had risen what he saw written in the face of the bearded man drove the blood from his cheeks for it was something he had dreaded in his dreams he knew himself to be cornered and fear set his nerves to jumping so uncontrollably that when he snatched the colt from its drawer and fired blindly he missed the place was crowded and it broke into a frightful confusion at the first shot none of those present told the same tale of what immediately followed but the stories agreed in this that john daniels neither hesitated nor quickened his approach although barclay emptied his gun so swiftly that the echoes blended then snapped it on a spent cartridge as the two clenched curious ones later searched out the bullet marks in wall and ceiling which showed beyond doubt the nervous panic under which the gambler had gone to pieces and so long as the building stood they remained objects of great interest now mcgill or daniels as he was known to the onlookers never went armed having yet to feel the need of other weapons than his hands he tore the gun from his victim's grasp then mauled him with it so fearfully that men shouted at him and hid their faces meanwhile he was speaking growling something into barclay's ears no one understood what it was he said until the confusion died and they heard these words and you'll go with my brand on you where everybody'll read it and know you're a rat next he did something that a great many had heard of but few even of the old-timers had witnessed he gun-branded his enemy barclay was little more than a pulp by this time he lay face up across the faro table with mcgill's fingers at his throat they thought the older man was about to brain him but instead he turned the revolver in his hand and drew the thin sharp-edged sight across barclay's forehead from temple to temple then from forelock to bridge of nose a stream of blood followed as the sight ripped through to the skull like a dull scalpel leaving a ragged disfiguring cross above the gambler's eyes it scarred the bone it formed a hideous mutilation that would last as long as the fellow lived and constitute a brand of infamy to single him out from ten thousand telling the story of his dishonor when he had finished mcgill raised the wretch bodily and flung him half across the room as if he were unclean then without a glance to right or left he went forth as he had come his wife was waiting with her ears covered but she saw the blood on his hands when she opened her eyes and cried out it's his he told her roughly i don't think i killed him i tried not to for her sake he inclined his head towards the inner door but it was hard to hold in after all this time he'll never trouble you again when do you mean to take the baby she whispered now she no no not yet let her stay here a little while till i'm strong enough to let her go just a little while mcgill you're a good man don't you understand she was palsied incoherent with dread in her eyes was a look of death but he held out his empty arms crying hoarsely let me have my kitty so she went in and gathered up the sleeping babe it may have been the father's heartbeats that awakened the little one when she lay against his breast at any rate the blue eyes opened and stared up at him gravely astonishment alarm gave way to recognition she smiled drowsily and her lids closed again then a tiny hand curled around one of mcgill's fingers his face was wet when he raised it to the stricken woman and said gently we'll go now if you're ready alice what do you she stared at him wildly you don't want me mcgill not after all i've done all i am i've always wanted you he told her simply you'll have to come for she needs you holding the baby close with one arm he extended the other to his wife but she drew back choking not yet she managed to say through her tears not until you know i'm not all bad only weak he took her hand and together they went out walking slowly so as not to awaken the child end of story eleven end of the crimson gardenia and other tales of adventure by rex beach